I think as uh, what um, uh, Victor shared earlier, uh, one of the earliest use cases of blockchain is currency, and uh, one of the you know, successful businesses that already deployed and it's related about currency, remittance and brokerage, um, like and, you know, I think that they did before. So um, that's pretty much it. Uh, as it is right now, what we see currently. But aside from that, all the things that rest of us, our companies do right now is really experimentations of what we can do with the technology. So it's really highly experimental. Maybe David wants to add. Yeah, so you see in, in, in almost every market, people experimented in different ways. So the one you probably read about most is in financial services. Um, and there's a number of reasons for that. Um, so we had looked at trade finance, for example, uh, last year as a use case. Uh, and the reason that people look at that is it's an incredibly fractured market. Um, and you have all these different people having their own silos of information, but they need to share that information. Um, so blockchain enables you to share that information in limited quantities to limited parties. Uh, in a way that you can decide on. Depending on the blockchain that you're using, this, of course, is easier or more difficult. Um, the difficulty with that is you need to get all the different parties onto the system. So in the case of trade finance, you need to get the regulator involved, you need to get the importer involved, you need to get the exporter involved, you need to get the importer's bank involved. So you need all these different parties, and, and that's the real trick to it. Um, the technology itself, we have it. You know, digital signing has been around a long time, distributed ledger technology has been around a long time. I think what a lot of people are seeing now is the opportunity that, well, blockchain as a buzzword is pushing a lot of organizations to actually make the change into moving into digital. So one of the conversations that we had with banks as well is um, they're still very paper-based. So they see this as a way to create standards and to kind of move their firms forward and using blockchain technology, you can leapfrog a lot of things because it has a lot of built-in features. It has public-private key pairs, which allows the security of digital signing. Um, it has database systems built into it so you can store the information. Uh, it has messaging, essentially, as part of the infrastructure of it. When you send a transaction, you're essentially sending a message from one person to another person securely. Uh, so it has a lot of these things built into it. So you'll see it a lot used in, uh, I think, financial services. You'll see it. Not so much in high frequency trading in those sorts of situations because of the scaling issue uh, at this point, which is again getting solved, which is what Victor was talking about. Uh, you'll also see it in digitization of assets, which is what Darwin is, is looking at, which is uh, uh, digitization of real estate. Uh, one of the companies that, that we work, all work with in the, in the community here is Digex, which does digital gold, and there's a couple of different companies doing that. Uh, we have other people who are tracing diamonds, so we talked about provenance which is the, um, the origination of an item, or the current state of an item. So in diamonds, you have something called the Kimberley process where you record information about the diamond. Uh, you basically engrave a serial number onto it, and if you put that information onto a blockchain, you can then trace the history of it as it moves. So when you go and you buy a diamond, you can look at the serial number, check it on the blockchain, see whether or not it's a blood diamond, or a De Beers diamond, or whoever's diamond, and you can do that instantly, digitally. We're applying that towards digital certificates, which is diplomas, accreditation, licenses, uh, but it's a very similar technology. It's essentially putting that information into the blockchain. Um, in the case of manufacturers and furniture and things like that, then you start to talk about supply chain. You can track uh, the history of the items that are coming into your factory. You can trace the history, whether or not they're authentic or not. Uh, and you can start to do uh, things uh, in addition to that, for example, financing, letters of credit, uh, e-signing on top of that, uh, uh, what else? All sorts of different things. I, I would like to uh, touch on four points related to blockchain. Let me just make sure everybody can hear me back there. Raise your hand if you know what a permission ledger is. Okay. Or you don't know what permission ledger is. So let me start really at the basics. But what I want to cover is it's more than a currency. It's a different kind of database. It's a new platform for computing. And it's also a business. So starting really from the basics, you know, uh, Victor's first technical slide was showing about the creation of hash. Imagine your company have a magic machine. And you can feed in some legal documents of any length. 
and there's a little 16 digit LED display that after you feed in all these documents, it will display a number there or a sequence of 16 characters. And you copy this down in a ledger somewhere. So that's like a hash. And it's considered as a one-way hash because with these 16 characters, you can't recreate the document. But if you have an exact copy of the document and you feed it in or your colleague feeds it in to the same magic machine, it will generate the same 16-digit code. Now this hash is then written onto a serialized chain of transactions. And so this is where the anchoring that Victor refers to comes from. So think of a blockchain as a ledger, like a series or a serialized record of um, tamper-proof information. But when we say tamper-proof, it's because the chain of transactions is encrypted, but it's also tamper-proof because as you add new transactions to the end, they're stuck together in a way that references the earlier blocks. So for somebody to change a record that was just written is not trivial, but it's not that difficult. But for them to change an older record from two days ago or two years ago is almost impossible. So there's this concept that the chain becomes more secure as the hash rate increases, the number of transactions which are being recorded. Now, add to this the fact that you can put almost any type of transaction. So it's not only currency, but it could be assets. So you can have information like, let's say, a title deed to your property referenced with a hash anchored onto the blockchain. And therefore, this title deed is maybe encrypted and sitting in a file store somewhere. The hash can prove that if somebody retrieves the document later, they're retrieving the same document which was anchored onto the blockchain. You can put your insurance records onto the blockchain. You can put real estate and medical records onto the blockchain with this type of anchoring. Now, you can also um, think of these transactions as a kind of registry, like a set of, an index to a set of things that are stored off the chain, like passport records. And you can build an identity management system. Now, there's a particular type of transaction that's called an attestation. And what it means is you can make a claim that you've seen something. Like you ever uh, see in the newspaper a picture of some hostage holding up a picture, holding up a daily newspaper. And it proves that the hostage was alive on a particular day. So you can make a claim that the hostage was alive on a particular day, and you can tie it to a blockchain. And that's called an attestation. And that's a particular type of legal document used to anchor things from the real world back onto this digital chain. And the security of this chain is proportional to the hash rate, which is why we keep talking about cryptocurrencies, because the cryptocurrencies are the chains with the highest hash rate. They're the chains which everybody's working on to the tune of millions of transactions every day and every week. Now let me say why it's different than a database. We all think in terms of an SQL database, but a blockchain is a distributed database. It's not centralized anywhere. And the blockchain allows for all the parties to build consensus. So you can put these claims on the chain, and then the parties who have access to the chain can look at the claims and make their own judgment about whether the chain should be, so whether the claim or attestation should be honored or not. And so in a sense, you're building consensus by having many people writing to the chain and then looking at what's on the chain and making business decisions based on what they see on the chain. And so if a bank decides to then open an account for somebody based on the historical records that they've seen, they're essentially verifying all the earlier bits. And that builds the credit for the individual who is opening the account. Now, you can think of a blockchain as push technology. And what I'm comparing it to is this SQL database as pull. So all of us have been involved in big IT projects where you pull all the records into a central storage somewhere. And this is one of the problems with SQL, is that if my company has a central store and your company has a central store, it's very hard for us to share data. 
And so what we do with blockchain is instead of pulling things in, we push things out. So we push things out of the blockchain, and then we can build consensus. Now, we also hear about private blockchain and public blockchain, so let me try to clarify. If a private blockchain, you're really talking about something that's an in-house pilot project, truly a private blockchain. It has distribution. You can have multiple nodes in-house, but it has no consensus because you're only the one with the authority to read and write to your private blockchain. But if you have a consortium, let's say of banks or hospitals, sharing information on a semi-private blockchain, a consortium blockchain, then you have both distribution and consensus. Then you have trust because it's permission blockchain. All of the members of the consortium have given one another permission. And you won't let other people join your consortium unless you give them permission. So that's a permission blockchain, semi-private. And then finally, public. And this is where we're dealing within the wild transactions in e-currency. And this is where trust has to be built in other ways. You don't know the other guy. So you build trust through proof of work and other mechanisms. So now, as a new platform for software development, you have to think that first we have all the internet protocols. You have TCP IP, you have uh, HTTP, you have uh, uh, SSL, and you build on these. Now what's missing from this stack is trust. So all of our web applications, the things we've been doing from the dot-com days until now, is we're building on top of the basic web stack. We're building applications. But without trust, we can't easily share data. So what this uh, new technologies of blockchain allow is a new layer on top of the internet stack. So it's a development environment. And then finally, the blockchain is the business. So you can deploy blockchain in your company, or if you're a service provider, you can provide services for others and help them build blockchain solutions. Or you can create a new company that is a blockchain based. To give you an example of uh, what Victor mentioned is the remittance services. There's a company called Opera, A-B-R-A, -A, and they provide an app on your phone whereby you can send money to a party around the world. And that's a business that was built on blockchain. Now, you may hear people say, the blockchain isn't ready. It's too immature. The reality is that if you're proposing a blockchain solution, you're really proposing a business process re-engineering. About 80% of the problem or challenge in this effort is going to be business process re-engineering. And the 20% is the technology of blockchain. So if you hear this uh, opposition, tell your customer, Go back and work on your business re-engineering, your process re-engineering, and when you come back, the technology will be ready. 